how bad was it? Uh, as bad as it could get. As bad as it could get. Uh, this was not a. This was not some like uh, yo. I have a uh, over prescription of Xanax, and I don't really like how they make me feel, so I'm going to stop. This was a, a ten year, uh, day after day, bloodbath fight to the death bout with the the addiction to opiates and and uh amphetamines and xanax and everything under the fucking sun um i I like to consider that i was one of the forgotten ones and and people have already asked me and maybe you would you know who this book was for why did you write this book you have a you have a youtube audience who wants to see you uh uh you know jump off the roof into a ball pit Mm -hmm. do that Mm. why are you doing this 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 book is for the people who have nothing left to live for they have no hope left and that's exactly where i was from the age of 18 years old when uh, sorry 16 years old when i was given my first oxycontin Mm. in in a hospital bed because i'd broken my femur the feeling that that gave me the relief that it gave me over the thoughts that have spun in my head since i was a kid and the the relief from the pain i felt physically emotionally mentally the that was then followed up by uh months of painkillers being prescribed to me and i've been through that loop about five times for different surgeries mm-hmm, that i've had in my mm-hmm. in my life um when it came time for me to be 18, when i was 18 years old i tried my first oxy on the streets oxycon and i sniffed a 20 milligram oxycon and and from that day i always remember the day it was it was right down the street from my high school um uh, i was actually 17 i was a junior in high school by the time i was a senior in high school i was a full-blown uh addict and i couldn't go to school i couldn't um i, I did but I would sweat very similarly to the way you've seen me sweat on the yeah, show, yeah. but not from nervousness, but from uh, withdrawals to opiates. I have two things. Yeah. One, I think it's incredibly noble that you were as raw as you are in this book for the sake of the people who were going through what you went through. Uh, don't take this offensively, cool. but, but when you were in that stage and during the, that decade of battling uh, substance abuse and addiction, were you reading? Were you consuming content? Like, like, will they will they take the proactive action of reading a three hundred page book? It's a it's a great question. It's a great question, and and my, the answer for me is no. Um, it depends on you know it depends on the level of the addict it depends on how desperate their life is it depends on what you know their living arrangement. I mean, when I was for the majority of my addiction and the majority of the time that I spent uh, dependent on drugs and 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 whatever, I I had no home. Do you know what I'm saying? I slept on couches. I slept, I've slept in trunks of cars. I've slept in, I've slept outside, slept on the street. Um, and, uh, there, no, there was never a time where I was like, yo, there's a new book about to drop except for one time. And that was when I, when I took my first step to get clean and went to rehab and you find yourself in a hospital setting with no hope, but well, actually, let me, let me rephrase that. You find yourself in a hospital setting with a brand new hope and a, and a brand new kind of, lease on life. Mm. Yo, I might actually do this every time. And a lot of people, a lot of people who deal with addiction go to rehab multiple times. But every time you go, it's just a little spark. Like, yo, maybe this is the time And your family says, yo, maybe this is the time he gets it right. And they have that little hope. That's when you, that's when you want this book. Mm. That's when you want this book. Mm -mm. That's on the way up. When, when when you're in rehab, when you're in rehab, you have nothing to do. Mm. You have no, you, you, you go to groups, you, you, you spend a lot of time by yourself reflecting thinking about things that you regret or things you wish you could have done better, how you would have treated your wife better if the circumstances weren't the way they were. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of time to read. You have a ton of time to read. I read a lot when I was in rehab. And, uh, and so this is a, I I think it's a great piece for, for anybody. And I think we're in a different age now. A lot of the people that do reach out to me on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook or whatever are, are currently addicts. Mm -hmm. You know, I have two years, five years, eight years. I've been shooting heroin. I can't believe you're releasing this book. Like I, I've been going through this for so long and no one's ever spoke for me. I've never seen a celebrity. I've never, and especially a YouTuber. I've never seen a YouTuber. Wow. That talk, is, that is fascinating. Story, yeah. you know? um, and so, yeah, I mean, if it, for, for people that can get it, it's, it's, it's great. And I, w- and I will get this book to fucking rehabs. I will. I, I don't care if I have to buy a thousand copies myself. Like this mm. book will, will be on the shelf. It should also be said that Mac took the, uh, the cover. Yeah, image, I did. Yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is awesome. Uh, yeah. Mike, I know your mom. Yeah, yeah. Know your family, Robin. I know your sister. Yeah, they're they're, they're gems, all of them. Mm-hmm. So sweet, so kind. How does a seventeen year old from Connecticut, New Haven, Connecticut, get ad- addicted to drugs with a loving family, mother, sister, father, everything? Well, that I think that's like the biggest part of the story is that it 
quite literally can happen to anyone. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? It, it, and, it, and it is, it is. I mean, the, the biggest, the biggest story here is this book is a story of the past and is a story of things that happened to me. And I want it to be a tale of hope so that people can climb out and, and hopefully live whatever version of success is for themselves. But the bigger story here that's partially told and that is ongoing and present is the fact that more than 2 million people in this country right now are going through the same exact thing that I want. They're your brothers, they're your sisters, they're your best friends, they're your moms, your dads, your teachers, your janitors, the people that you knew as a kid growing up but haven't heard from in 15 years. Everyone knows someone who is struggling with this opiate epidemic that has claimed thousands and thousands and thousands of lives in this country. How did it happen to me? In the early 2000s, there was a there was a tidal wave of narcotics prescriptions written. Mm. And in all honesty, a large chunk of my graduating class was was an opiate addict by the time they graduated high school. All of them with loving families, all of them with with nice white picket fences, dogs, all that shit. But there was such a saturation and so such a, a mass amount of these pills that when they hit, they it was a tidal wave. It was a tidal wave. And there's and there's shows about this, like the pharmacists on Netflix right now that are that are massive telltales about Purdue Pharma and their over prescription. Is this is this this isn't the actual It's not the actual book. God, I was gonna read the uh the uh, uh what's it called in the beginning? The the preface? No, the your thanks your thanks or the, your, the I, can, I can get I can get your it, shout yeah. outs? What are yeah, they called? The acknowledgements. Acknowledgements. Yeah. You gave the acknowledge acknowledgements to everyone who you felt played a pivotal part in your life, and then at the, the very end you said to Purdue Pharma, dot, 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 fuck you. Yeah. You've been very outspoken about the opioid epidemic. I mean, imagine if there was one beer. Imagine if there was one kind of cocaine that mm. was everywhere. It was just one brand. Mm. One fucking brand did this. One company, bro, with all the thousands of other competitors, all the other thousands of pills on the market, one pill did this. The holy grail of narcotics. Oxycontin. Bro. Oxycontin. You, you trace back any opiate addiction story right now. And there's a ton, which is another reason I almost didn't write this book. The, the, the prevalence it's of this story is, is saturated as fuck right yeah, now. Yeah. Unfortunately for my competitors, they don't have millions of subscribers and uh, the <laughs> best friends with Logan Paul, a great podcast. But uh, <laughs> but um, it all traces back to one place, yeah. Stanford, Connecticut. How ironic. Damn. The last city I fucking lived and worked mm. in before I moved here. Purdue Pharma. I'm calling conspiracy. Crazy. <laughs> Not he did it to himself for the, this. The, the, the Sackler family, one of the most powerful families in, in, in the world, produced this magical they called it the 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 miracle drug Mm -hmm. the miracle pill it was oxycontin it was going to be the pill that solved all of the problems of the chronically ill you take this pill it's got a time release seal on it when you take it the 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 pill will it the seal will allow the pill to to be released at a pace so the person could take one pill and be good for two days now these are terminal cancer patients or chronically uh acute with acute pain Mm -hmm. Somehow, whether they knew it was going to happen or not, as soon as that pill hit the streets, people found out how to take the time release seal off of it. I learned how to take the time release seal off an Oxycontin when I was 17 years old in my friend's uh, Mitsubishi in the, in the passenger seat as he played Bone Thugs in Harmony. I sucked an, eight, an 80 milligram Oxycontin seal off, which then rendered that time release completely useless and mm-hmm. allowed you to obliterate the pill and turn it into prescribed heroin. Wow. And... At the time, prior prior to OxyContin, back things up 20 years to when your parents partied and my parents partied, there was Quaaludes. We had had Wolf of Wall Street on the show. Yeah. There was Quaaludes. There was always uh, different pills for mood boosting and this and that. And there was Percocet and there was Vicodin. Mm -hmm. Purdue Pharma put 32 Percocets behind a time release seal. 32. So when you look at that pill, you say, oh, that's a pill. I've had one of those. I've had a a Percocet before. I could eat OxyContin. Mm -hmm. And you just left your 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 first play as a as a freshman. You're a freshman in high school, and you go to a party and you played basketball the night, and your team won. And somebody says, "Yo, this is like a Percocet, man. Take one of these, 80 milligram oxy." Chokes to death on his vomit in the backseat of the car. Freshman high school. That story is 
Happened to our happened to our substitute. Hundreds of thousands. Happened to our bro. substitute at oh, at chalk. at high school. Yeah. Uh, our gener or the generation right above us. I think I've told you this in our city. That was my. That was that would have been me, right? Our high school was nicknamed Heroin High. Right. You guys had a real big problem. Yeah. With it. Yeah. It, it it was a couple years. Before. Just missed us. Yep. But I did. I until I uh, got to know you and you explained to me this. Um, this problem, I was not aware of how uh, how prevalent this the opiate epidemic was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's massive. 